<laughs> okay. Okay, so we are live now. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the FAS public lecture co-organized by the Foundation for Agrarian Studies, Bangalore, and Rosa Luxemburg uh, Stiftung, South Asia. Um, so I would like the director of the foundation, Sandeepan Bakshi, to please start the proceedings of today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Dehira. And uh, hello all, on behalf of the Foundation for Agrarian Studies, I welcome all of you to this public lecture on science and technology in agriculture in India, an introduction and context. The foundation is a charitable trust based in India and established in 2003 with major objective as uh, facilitating multidisciplinary theoretical and empirical inquiry in the field of agrarian studies in India and elsewhere in less developed countries. As part of our dissemination and outreach program, we regularly conduct seminars, conferences, workshops, uh, now of course in the online mode, to disseminate the results of our research to the wider academic community, peasants and agricultural workers organizations and women's associations. We are known for our work with, the young, with young scholars. In the pre-COVID period, we used to organize annual workshops to explore the research interests of young scholars working in the field of agrarian studies and on socioeconomic life in rural India. The first young scholars workshop was organized in December 2017, which was quickly followed by the second in March 2018. Both of them were attended by more than 50 uh, scholars from different parts of the country. We had prepared for a third Young Scholars Workshop in March 2020 when the pandemic struck and we had to cancel that event. The special theme for that workshop was science and technology in Indian agriculture. It was to cover a range of topics, including the development of science and technology in Indian agriculture, agriculture research and extension, and environmental sustainability. We also planned to have critical discussion on some of the contemporary and uh, very contentious debates on the subject, around the subject. We have since then tried to, or thought about more than a couple of times to organize the workshop uh, on the theme, but the last 10, 20 months have been very difficult and uns full of uncertainties. So eventually we have, we have decided to settle down for a lecture series, beginning with this public lecture on the role played by science and technology in shaping Indian agriculture production in the last uh, half a century or so. The lecture today will be followed by a series of four lecture series uh, that will be held uh, in the next four, coming four Wednesdays with one Wednesday as a gap for Diwali vacations. Uh, these are not public in the sense that they will not be, you know, will not be streaming them live in our, uh, on our social media platforms. We'll be sharing Google Forms and uh, through the email and our social media uh, uh, channels. And those who apply through the Google Forms uh, will receive a Zoom link. Divya, Nihira, may I please uh, request you to share uh, yes, the sir. screen? Yeah, that shows the schedule. OK, so these are the four lectures after today's public lecture. The uh, next one is on October 27th. Uh, by Dr. Rajendra Prashad, followed by uh, one on November 10th, November 17th, and November 24th. So this schedule and the Google Forms will be made available to all of you through emails and social media from tomorrow. And I, I hope and request that all of you who are participating today would participate in the lecture series as well. Okay. Now coming to the thematic focus for today's talk and the lecture series that uh, will follow, I'd like to tell you that we at the foundation uh, have been cons consistently engaging with this subject matter from a social science perspective, whether it is on the, uh, whether be it the contemporary debates or the history of agriculture science and technology in India. While we take pride in this endeavor of ours, it is a matter of concern that social science studies on this important theme has been limited, which may I also add, has led to extreme views that are neither objective nor helpful to the cause of agricultural advancement. In the month of August 2016, the foundation organized a small group meeting at the Indian Statistical Institute, Bangalore, 
that attempted to critically engage with what may be called views prevalent among some sections of the social science community as well as a group a group of uh, uh, peasant activists the meeting came out with a statement which we believe uh, could be the basis for further studies and debates on the subject matter i will now take few minutes to read out some excerpts from the statement that you will also see on your screen as i speak divya can you please share the screen yeah so uh, the statement begins by acknowledging that agriculture is essential to the survival of human kind for the provision of not just food and nutrition but also fuel and construction material and therefore we say that agriculture needs constant advance both to meet meet the new challenges of climate change and other ecological pressures and also food and uh, nutrition security of at least an, uh, a population of 9.7 billion which is predicted to be so by the year 2050 it is in this background that modern developments in science and technology becomes crucial to agricultural production and its advancement in recent years however the application of science and technology to agriculture has been under sustained attack from some who profess commitment to protection of the environment with sustainable agriculture and enhancement of the livelihood of working people and rural poor while we also adhere to these goals we respect these goals and share these objectives it is uh, about the means towards at, at, at achieving those goals that there are severe divisions the usual targets of persistent attacks that you can see on your screen seed material any any kind of seed material that is produced off farm whether it is high yielding varieties transgenics any kind of synthetic chemicals used for plant protection uh, for soil nutrition enhancement host of modern farming uh, practices including mechanization any medium or large scale irrigation schemes the use of ground water these are all examples which are constantly under attack uh, you know uh, in in the recent times please go to the next slide now uh, our statement says that the, these questions some of these questions around careful deployment of new technologies and destruction of agrarian he heritage are sincere however the concern lies with the hostility to the very method of science itself this criticism of agriculture science is often based on ephemeral measures of public opinion anecdotes hearsay and surveys which are generally characterized by faulty methods we on the other hand say that the major concern the critical concern in you know when we look at agriculture science research and extension today is the private capture of scientific research and a stark example of this is the increasing concentration of scientific research uh, in the private sector in uh, whether in whether when we look at the area of genetic engineering or biotechnology this is while while it is a truism that research and extension undertaken by national agricultural research systems and international public access institutions drove the green revolution of the mid 20th century what we observe here is a tendency to conflate the very serious concerns related to ownership of technology with the use of technology itself it is this conflation that makes us feel that there is a need for to develop a more nuanced understanding and this lecture series is another attempt from the from our end from our side to address the need for an objective understanding of the role of science and technology in advancing sustainable agricultural production with these words if you can exit the share screen yeah uh, may i call upon uh, professor madhuna swaminathan head uh, of the economic analysis unit indian statistical institute bangalore and chairperson of the ms swaminathan research foundation chennai and also a trustee of the foundation for agrarian studies uh, to chair today's uh, event we are very grateful to professor swaminathan for agreeing to chair the session at a very short notice we had initially requested professor kc bansal secretary national academy of agricultural sciences who was to chair the session but had to at the last moment attend to some other urgent work responsibility and could not join us today 
May once again call upon Professor Madhura Swaminathan. Madhura. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Sandeepan. And I think this uh, series of lectures being inaugurated by Professor Ram Kumar today is coming at a very uh, opportune moment because uh, you know science is being derided and irrationality is on the rise. It's very important today to examine the role of science and scientific temper in every sphere of life. And we are going to start with uh, the context of agriculture today. I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor R. Ramkumar, uh, who is professor at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Uh, he is wide ranging interests but I think has started his doctoral work in the issue of agrarian studies, and that remains a continuing interest for him uh, through his uh, research on a variety of issues. Uh, most recent book of his was called Note Bandi, and it was on demonetization and its effects on the disastrous effects on the Indian economy. I'm also happy to tell you that he has a forthcoming book on agriculture. Uh, called A Hard Time, Indian Agriculture After Liberalization, which should be out by the end of the year, early next year. And I think that will be a very comprehensive study of the effects of liberalization on the uh, agricultural economy and on the people in the agricultural uh, economy. So uh, welcome, uh, Ram Kumar, and over to you. Thank you, Professor Swaminathan. And uh, I must start by thanking the Foundation for Agrarian Studies and uh, its leadership for thinking about initiating a lecture series of this kind, which is extremely important in the times uh, we live. As Professor Swaminathan mentioned, this is the time of uh, spread of rational thoughts, uh, superstitions, uh, and a number of uh, a uh, number of uh, arguments which uh, are completely, uh, completely uh, counter, run completely counter to any idea of rational thought. And this assault on reason, as we call it, uh, requires that the message of science and technology uh, is spread among the people and the impacts of it are uh, explained to people uh, in simple terms. Uh, in that sense, I think this lecture series on uh, science and technology in agriculture will be a very useful starting point to initiate a larger discussion and debate in the public uh, as to how to recapture the spirit of science and reason in agriculture itself. Uh, so let me, uh, let me begin by uh, sharing my screen. And I think I'll speak for about roughly uh, an hour or so, uh, after which uh, I'll be happy to uh, engage with questions, uh, which I'm sure will be moderated by the chair. Uh, so basically, uh, this lecture is about science and technology in, an, in, in Indian agriculture. And this is more uh, pitched as a kind of preface to the lectures that are likely to follow from here. Uh, that is, which will look at different specific themes and sub-themes uh, in agriculture and agricultural science. What I shall do today is to give a broad overview of uh, the subject, the evolution of the subject of science and technology in, in agriculture. And I, I shall be drawing extensively from published literature uh, on the subject. And each slide of mine will have a small footnote, which will be a reference text for uh, further reading, as well as a pointer to where, where I picked uh, those points from. Uh, so uh, I, I hope uh, uh, I will be able to uh, uh, provide the uh, audience with uh, a good set of readings as well at the end of this lecture as to where to look for in, when you have a particular question to ask about agricultural science. Uh, so let me begin. My uh, lecture is going to be broadly uh, structured in this way. I shall begin by flagging the importance of the role of science and technology in agriculture. Uh, I shall then discuss the case of India in particular, how science and technology in agriculture evolved right from the time of British rule 
and then into uh, the time of independence and after, and then discuss the time of green revolution in greater detail, uh, which also uh, sits together with the question of how various institutional developments took place in uh, India's agricultural research sector. I shall then spend some time on the achievements uh, as to how different crops and their production and productivity performed uh, in this period. And towards the end, I shall take up two issues. One is uh, the question of interface between agrarian relations and uh, the agricultural technology and its diffusion. Uh, and finally, some debates that exist in terms of uh, new technologies in agriculture. So this is broadly how I'm going to structure uh, my lecture. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope I'll be able to do justice to each one of them uh, by the end of this. Let me begin by thinking about uh, the role of science and technology in agriculture. Now, uh, what are the major features that uh, mark uh, the new phase of modern agriculture? as opposed to primitive agriculture. Uh, there are at least three points here uh, in my view. And the first is the coming in of modern science and technology in agriculture has meant that agriculture shifted from being extensive to being more intensive. And that's a very important feature of the coming in of modern science and technology. The second important feature here is a shift from crop improvement by farmers, rather exclusively by farmers, to crop improvement by scientists with farmers. I think that that, that formulation is very important. It's not true that scientists uh, sit in a compartmentalized laboratory and develop new varieties and so on. It's crop improvement by scientists with farmers, taking with their active participation, uh, generating feedback from the farmers and correcting uh, the technological uh, specifications if required. That's the second important feature. A third important feature is the shift from a situation of uncertainty to a situation of better predictability. Primitive methods of plant breeding, for example, were purely trial and error methods. And you had absolutely no certainty as to what the outcome would be or what the traits in the uh, offspring would be. But modern science and technology provides enormous amount of predictability, if not precision, to the method of plant breeding and the use of science in agriculture. So broadly, these three are the three important features of this shift that you see uh, over the last uh, century or more from primitive agriculture to what we can call as modern agriculture. Agricultural science is also different from other uh, scientific disciplines in one important respect. And this respect is apart from basic research, which, is imp which implies the expansion of the stock of basic knowledge itself, and the expansion of applied research, which is a goal-oriented enterprise. The first two are applicable to most scientific disciplines, but in agriculture, a third aspect is also equally important, which is the question of adaptive research. Now, the varieties that are developed in the, in the laboratories are, are constantly tested in farmers' fields and improvised. And here, uh, as, as, as I said earlier, crop improvement by scientists with farmers. So this whole question of testing it in the farmers' field and then bringing it back and then improvising it is also a very important part of agricultural research, which is not so much predominant in the case of other scientific uh, uh, realms, may I say. So basically, the role of science and technology in agriculture is very, very uh, has its own unique features, as this slide uh, tells us. Now, if you look at how this science and technology evolved in agriculture, you will see that it is primarily a 20th century phenomenon. You can date it to somewhere around 1850s and later, that is the late 19th century, but its adoption and use are primarily a 20th century phenomenon. So from the mid-1800s, mid you will see 
a series of innovations taking place, which actually mark a huge breakthrough in the way farming is undertaken as an enterprise. You have innovations in soil chemistry by Liebig, in crop agronomy by Bossingold, the discovery of super, uh, superphosphate uh, in 1842 by uh, John Bennett Laws. Then two very important uh, works at that point of time on evolution by Charles Darwin and the, the, uh, the rather uh, development of uh, plant genetics by Gregor Mendel uh, in 1865. All these were features of agricultural science and its development in the second half of the 19th century. But these were largely theoretical developments, conceptual developments. There was another one in the early part of the 20th century. For the first time, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was won by Fritz Haber for synthesizing ammonia. And that was also something that contributed significantly to, uh, to, uh, to uh, the, the use of science in agriculture. Uh, also in 1913 uh, or so, you will see BAS of uh, 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 sort of starting the first ammonia plant uh, and so on. So all those are features of the early 20th century. These scientific endeavors are disrupted by the two world wars, as well as the Great Depression that comes in between. But there are some developments that take place in between. From the 1930s onwards, there is some amount of increased adoption of improved seed varieties in United States, Europe, and so on. But though science was ready in this form, large-scale adoptions of this technology begin only after the Second World War. And that is something that is a global phenomenon, and that's also true for India. This is the time when crop yields begin to rise uh, in uh, on, on a very rapid at, at a very rapid rate, and technologies of the new era are adopted on a large scale by farmers. In India, if you come and see what uh, how agricultural research was performing during the time of the British, the role of the British in agricultural research was important, but it was also selective. These uh, endeavors in agricultural research were limited to a few crops where the British had commercial interests, wheat, cotton, jute, tea, etc. Also, with the uh, occurrence of frequent famines in that time, with the uh, establishment and uh, the reports of the different famine commissions, three of them at that time, the John Volker Committee of 1889, and also the Royal Commission on Agriculture in 1926. There were some efforts by the British to begin uh, activities on the agricultural research front to create what they called as quote unquote, scientific agriculture. That was something that began during this period. And you will see on the right side of this slide, a series of agricultural research institutions, which were established during the colonial rule in India beginning from the Imperial Bacteriological Laboratory in Pune in 1889, IARI, which was Imperial Agricultural Research Institute at that time, later became Indian. Similarly, uh, the Imperial Veterinary Research Institute in Izzatnagar and Mukteshwar. Then the formation of ICAR, Imperial, then Indian, uh, in 1929. The Department of Agriculture was formed. Then you had uh, uh, different institutes for uh, different crops or subsectors specifically, like for example, uh, cotton, uh, sugarcane, tea, etc., etc. Number of commodity committees were formed, a rubber research institute was formed. So all these were actually uh, endeavors of the British time. Nevertheless, as uh, Nanavati and Nanjaria point out in their path-breaking book called The Indian Rural Problem, they say that all of this work, which was so far, narrowly confined to the laboratory and the experiment station, has not been brought into living organic relationship to the work on the fields. And they ask, all this work has been done. Institutional development uh, has occurred. But what does all this come in the aggregate? Is the rate of progress satisfactory, considering the seriousness of the problem? Has Indian agriculture been set on the right path? And they said 
These are not satisfactory for a subcontinent of the size of India. There are some excellent results, results by way of better yields at various laboratories and research stations, but of what avail is all this as long as the stream of knowledge is not duly canalized so as to fertilize the actual fields and farms where the cultivator works. Others, for example, like Carl Prey have also argued that the real lacuna in the British period was that there was uh, basic research and applied research, but very little adaptive research. That's another literature, but I'm not going into that at this point of time. So essentially, by the time we were independent, Nanavati and Anjariya say that we were in a vicious cycle of poverty and primitive technique. Yields were low in declining in many, in many crops. Professor Bakchi, who is here in the audience, has done enormous amount of work uh, uh, also in criticism of uh, the estimates provided by uh, Heston for the colonial time. There were imbalances between regions which were growing over time. Soil quality and fertility was declining. The seeds used were of poor quality and the livestock were poorly yielding. Large extents of cultivated, cultivable land were actually left fallow and irrigation facilities apart outside the canal colonies were very poorly developed. And as a result, you will see that food grain output in India during the last 50 years of the British rule grew at a meager 0.1% per annum, whereas the population was growing at more than 3% per annum, which resulted in a sharp fall in food grain availability per head from about 200 kg per person to 150 kg per person. This is the broad context in which agricultural research begins after independence. There are mainly four protagonists in this whole story that we are talking about. Government of India, which played a leadership role, investing, regulating, spending, etc. Multilateral and bilateral donor agencies, such as USAID, for example, the International Agricultural Research Institution, the International Rice Research Institute in Manila in Philippines, and the CIMIT in Mexico for wheat and maize. And finally, the Indian farmers themselves. It was a joint enterprise of all these four uh, protagonists, which uh, led to a development of Indian agricultural research in the early parts or early periods of Indian independence. And scholars have basically said that you can actually divide uh, the first 25 years or so of independence into three broad phases in terms of development of agricultural research. In the first phase between 1952 and 1965, the idea was to develop a new and indigenous national agricultural research system. So basically, you had the USAID coming in and playing a very important role in developing agricultural universities in India. The first agricultural university was formed in Pantnagar in 1960 during this period, and many other agricultural universities at the state level were formed from the early 60s onwards. The Rockefeller Foundation played a very important role in developing the National Agricultural Research System itself, and the Ford Foundation played a very important role in spreading adaptive research in different parts of the country. So these were important developments of phase one. Phase two saw a very important effort to overhaul and reform agricultural bureaucracy to facilitate H, uh, the transfer and diffusion of HYV technology, high yielding variety technology. Here, C. Subramaniam played a very important role. He uh, sort of uh, reformed the agriculture department completely. He created uh, uh, the, uh, the ICAR that, and the director general of ICAR was not anymore an, a civil service officer, but an agricultural scientist. The Agricultural Research Service or the ARS, which was a cadre, specific, uh, special cadre of agricultural scientists was formed during this time. All these were developments of the second phase. The third phase was where all these was put into, were put into action. Changes in agricultural practices as a result of uh, intensified agricultural extension activities via the introduction of uh, high yielding varieties and other uh, aspects of that package among farmers. So there are broadly three phases here that we can think about. What were the major issues of Indian agriculture at this time? Indian agriculture very clearly had very low soil fertility, thousands of years of soil erosion, and very poor 
levels of crop management had meant that soil fertility was, was uh, on a decline in a big way. Second is countries like India had this problem of a high ratio of cultivated land to total cultivable land. A lot of land that can be cultivated are already cultivated. So more land can be brought into cultivation only by cutting down forests and creating new areas. So extensive. That's the, that's the only option that is available. To quote Professor Swaminathan, uh, Professor M.S. Swaminathan here, he would say it would be a tremendous onslaught on fragile lands and forest margins if we are to go uh, the extensive route. Most cultivars are products of selection for adaptation to adverse conditions historically. They are not products of selection for or products of selection very consciously made for higher productivity. You only wanted to survive. You did not want to grow. That's the level of that was also the level of development of science at that point of time. But it was nevertheless a fact that most of selection was for adaptation and not for improving productivity. So these three were three important uh, uh, weak points, may I say, of Indian agriculture at that point of time when India became independent. But with Green Revolution, and I borrow this term from Professor M. S. Swaminathan's work, it's basically the genetic destruction of yield barriers. And there is a beautiful paper which you will see as the footnote here, uh, which uh, 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 is very important to understand this phase, where Professor Swaminathan talks about the way in which India, for the first time in history, genetically destroyed the barriers to higher yield. And that's something which is very important. And he gives this point where over 10,000 years of agricultural development till 1950, India could produce only 50 million tons of food grains in one year. But in just 25 years from there, by 75, 1975-76, India produced more than double of it in a year. We were producing 121 million tons in a year by 1975-76. So what could not be done in 10,000 years could be done and could be further improved upon in about 25 years' time. And that's what is the genetic destruction of yield barrier all about. So there was breeding of new seed varieties, which were selected specifically, consciously, for higher yield potential and not just for adaptation to adverse conditions. The breeding of new seed varieties were such that you ensured that these seeds would respond to better agronomic practices. For example, if adequate sunlight is available, if adequate water is available, if more fertilizers are applied, then in the presence of these applications and practices, they would provide you with higher yield. Finally, the focus was on breeding plants with a morphological architecture and a developmental pattern in its physiology which is conducive to such a response. That is, higher yields as well as response to better agronomy. So these three were important uh, uh, objectives of the new breeding regime that came up with the Green Revolution, which was what was instrumental in the genetic destruction of yield barriers. And uh, you will see this from the FAO production uh, yearbooks of that period. You will see that in those uh, areas or those regions of the world where more nutrients were applied, those black bars are there, wheat is on the left side and, and rice is on the right side, you will see yields were phenomenally higher in those countries where the application of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus and potash fertilizers were actually higher. And that was something which was uh, a very important feature of uh, uh, change in this period with respect to how uh, agronomic, agronomic practices were uh, developed and diffused. Let me take the example of Indian rice, Indica rice, in this particular respect. Wheat, uh, sorry, rice production in India at this point of time, the early years of independence, prior to Green Revolution, faced multiple constraints. These rice plants that were available were had 
uh, had stem and straw, which were weak and tall, which meant that most of them were susceptible to bending down as the height grew. And this phenomenon was called lodging. A lot of it because rice is cultivated in submerged fields. This would mean that the grains would touch the water and there would be, there, there would be enormous amount of, amounts of crop loss. Now, this was a very important problem. All the plants that you had traditionally were having weak and tall straw. They also had a poor trap of calories because most of them were cultivated, at least in the first crop season, in the cloudy monsoon seasons where adequate exposure to sunlight was not actually available. Most of them were also season bound. Season bound in the sense that many of them were photosensitive. As a result, their, their response to uh, application of inputs was not straightforward. It was dependent on how much sunlight was available to them uh, in, the, in, in, in terms of the number of hours of sunlight available per day. That is something that was uh, another uh, uh, important constraint during this time. And because of their architecture, the upper leaves and lower leaves were, were developed in such a way that the upper leaves uh, hid a lot of sunlight that should have been available for local leaves. And as a result, sunlight was not fully utilized and photosynthesis suffered as a result. Poor water management was another problem and also poor pest and disease control was yet another problem for which no solutions were available at that point of time. So all these were clearly issues that existed in rice production at that time. It was at this point that the Chinese scientists, a lot of people think that Green Revolution came from the West. Green Revolution did not come from the West. Green Revolution actually came from the East. In fact, it may have gone via the West and come, but it did come from the East. That's the key point to note here. And the East does not include Australia and New Zealand. And this is very important. Chinese scientists at that point of time found a mutant variety which was very classic at that point of time. It was like a Eureka moment for many of them, DG Wujen. And this DG Wujen was a variety which was dwarf, 60, 60 centimeters in height, and hence would not lodge, had thick skin. And they also had uh, stiff and erect leaves so as to allow better flow of sunlight to leaves below. These Seeds were also photo insensitive. They were not susceptible to changes in the relative lengths of day and night in terms of their yield performance. And also, finally, they had no seed dormancy. In other words, you could sow immediately after harvest. The dormancy period is simply not there. So it quickens the uh, uh, shifting of one crop into another crop. So this was a very important feature at that point of time. And from DG Wujen, Taiwan developed a new variety called the Taichung Native One in 1956, which was the world's first semi-dwarf rice, where a tall indica variety was crossed with this DG Wujen, and you got an offspring which had stiff and upright leaves, which was dwarf, which had synchronous stillering, which had photoinsensitivity, which had drought resistance, and also something which had no dormancy. And this was something, this TN1 was some kind of a major uh, breakthrough at that point of time in the development of rice varieties across the, uh, the countries of Asia at least. This TN1 was brought to India along with its uh, prototypes called IR8, IR5, etc. And when crossed with a tall variety from Odisha, T141, this gave rise to varieties like Jaya and Padma, which are still in use in many parts of India. These were one of the first high yielding varieties of seeds which were developed in rice by India's agricultural scientists. Then came a variety of other uh, 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 seeds uh, and varieties, Hamsa, Krishna, Kaveri, Bala, Ratna, all these were actually products of the 1960s and 1970s. If this was the case with Indica rice, Similar was the case with Japonica rice also. And later, the products of Indica, variety, Indica uh, crosses were actually crossed again with Japonica variety. So Indica versus Japonica was another uh, cross which was uh, practiced at that point of time. And you got really excellent seeds 
as a result. For example, ADT27, uh, which was widely used in Tanjavur at that point of time, gave you a yield of five tons per hectare. It just had 105 days duration, short duration it was, and it also had high protein content. So all these were very important discoveries in the field of rice. And suddenly, what Swaminath, Professor Swaminathan said about genetic destruction of yield barriers, 10 tons per hectare in paddy looked very much possible at that point of time. So this is a graph which will tell you uh, the uh, trends in uh, the uh, productivity of paddy uh, in India. You will, it's, it's in kg per hectare. You will see that in 1965-67, you were somewhere around 1,300 kilograms per hectare. And by 1987-89, India had more than doubled its productivity in rice. We were at 2,616, and it has almost doubled again by 2019. Okay, so we all we had some kind of two doublings in productivity of rice over uh, the last uh, uh, 60 years or, or, or 60 to 65 years, so to say, uh, where we have made tremendous advances in increasing the productivity of rice as a result. And you can see this has been a linear process. This has been uh, something which has continued without much of uh, 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 a disruption. Of course, there have been periods where growth rates of productivity growth uh, have fallen, but on an average, you will see that the trend of growth has continued. And this has also meant that you could double the production of uh, rice in India from about 30 million tons in the mid 1960s to 60 million tons by 1983-84. And yet another doubling over uh, the next period, right up to 2021. Now you are producing close to 122 million tons of paddy in India. And that's a remarkable achievement. From 30 million tons, uh, you have actually made it four times. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you are now at 122 million tons. This is the story of rice. Come to wheat. Wheat had a slightly older history compared to rice in terms of agricultural research. IARA had developed two or three varieties, which already had yields of close to three tons per hectare before independence. And that was done in the Imperial Agricultural Research Institute in Pusa. And in 1935, one of India's foremost agricultural scientists in wheat, Benjamin Peary Pal, BP Pal, uh, he successfully added the quality of resistance to rust diseases into this. And he developed new varieties uh, from Pusa, uh, his Pusa Research Center as well. But then much more work was to be done in wheat, not just in productivity, but also in quality. People preferred bold, hard, amber and lustrous grains in terms of wheat, because a lot of people uh, stored uh, these uh, wheat grains in mud boxes uh, for a longer period of time because they preferred this rice to make chapatis and so on in their houses, which meant that they needed wheat uh, varieties which would withstand the conditions of storage. So uh, it should, uh, it should uh, stay for a long time. It should also protect itself from uh, weevils which attack them during the storage period. And that was something that scientists were really looking at at that point of time. In wheat also, you needed uh, shorter dwarf varieties because lodging because of tall straw was a problem here as well. Because of lodging, you had a difficulty in irrigation because if you put water, it will lodge and then it will actually destroy uh, the crop production. But if you don't water, because you are scared of lodging, then what will happen is by March, when temperatures rise, which is the time of grain development, there well, is very, very little soil moisture in the field, which will mean that yields fall again remarkably. And Albert Howard was once to say, wheat yield in India is a gamble in temperature at that point of time. And this susceptibility to rust and loose mud also was a serious problem to be uh, tackled. So you had the problem of, uh, uh, lodging, you had the problem of uh, susceptibility to pests and diseases, you also wanted to increase productivity. And here again, the solution came from the east, not the west. There was a dwarf Japanese variety called Norin 10, which came from Japan, which 
was dwarf, but dwarf in wheat was not a new thing. People knew about dwarf uh, wheat varieties, unlike in rice. But this Norinten came with dense and compact ears, and that was a big problem at that point of time. But Norin, uh, the, the version of Norinten that was made available from Japan actually was both dwarf and it also did not have dense and compact ears. And this was the variety that reached Norman Burlock uh, in uh, Simit uh, in Mexico City from uh, Japan. That's the via the West that I was talking about a little while back from the East. And after the research that was undertaken there, it was this variety of Norin 10 that was given to India in 1964 via the Rockefeller Foundation and the government of Mexico. They gave us Norin 10, Lerma Rojo, Sonora 6364, and Mayo 64. All these were provided to India. And what did Indian scientists do? They cultivated these varieties in India by adding additionally, compared to primitive methods, 80 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And when they did that, yields rose from three tons per hectare to six to eight tons per hectare. So that was the uh, remarkable rise in uh, uh, productivity that was clearly visible uh, when uh, these varieties were planted along with the application of fertilizers. And this led to the uh, notification of large number of new varieties of wheat, Kalyan Sona, Sonalika, uh, Sarbati Sonora, Choti Lerma, Safed Lerma, et cetera, et cetera. All these came as part of that. Here is a graph, just as in rice, of the trends in the productivity of wheat. You can see wheat productivity was about 827 kilograms per hectare in the mid 1960s, which doubled to 1,630 kilograms per hectare by 1981 in about 15 years or so. And it doubled again to about 3,200 by 2013. And now we have wheat productivity of about 3,500 kilograms per hectare. This is an average. So there are, uh, uh, this is the national average. So clearly there are large areas of India where the yield barrier was destroyed and you actually get seven, eight, nine tons per hectare uh, for sure. And that's uh, what this average basically shows. And that also meant that production of wheat also increased rapidly. Doubling between 73, 74, uh, doubling between 66 and 73, and again doubling between 73 and 83, and one more doubling between uh, uh, 83 and about 2012. And now we are at about 110 million tons of wheat production. So, both in rice and wheat, the rice in production through the rice in productivity was the important feature of this time. Now, this also uh, was a period when the government spent a lot in uh, agricultural research. Public investment in agricultural research as a percentage of value of production was rising regularly during this period. You know, at this, uh, by 1966, we had reached 0.18%, but that was not adequate, may I say, because developed countries were at that point of time investing 1% of their value of production in agricultural research. And we were only uh, putting 0.18%, which was much lower than the international standard. But nevertheless, it was uh, much higher than what India used to do in the past. You can see the number of publications by scientists in this period growing up, growing uh, at a remarkable pace. And you also see the number of publications per $100 value of production, $100 million value of production. And that's also uh, another indicator of productivity that you should take for agricultural science. Uh, you will see that the number of publications per $100 million value of production was actually uh, close to double with, by uh, the first 15 years of independence. And that's, an, an, that's another indicator of how uh, robust was the development of science and technology uh, in this time. Now, this continued even after uh, the mid 60s. You can see right up to the early 90s, you will see the rise of expenditure, public expenditure on agricultural research and development, including education. And this does not include, of course, the graph that appears below in dotted lines, which is the contribution uh, to India by 
international institutions like IRI, CIMIT, etc. And also ICRISAT in Hyderabad. Uh, and if you look at another feature, the center state division of expenditures, you will see from 1970s onwards, what you also see is the role of the states in funding public agricultural research has been growing rapidly. Today, uh, states contribute close to half of the total agricultural research expenditure in India. But, so the, the rising importance of states in, 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 in investing in agricultural research is yet another feature of this period that we are talking about, certainly up to the early 90s. Now, once this early phase was over, you moved into, into the late 70s and 1980s, where research moved into new territories. In rice and wheat, for example, public research was moving into developing more hybrids rather than varieties, certainly. So it was now doing both hybrids and varieties. It was trying to instill more resistance in uh, two pests and diseases in the new hybrids and varieties. And an effort was on at this point of time, both in rice and wheat, to mostly Indianize their genetic makeups. By what, what, what I mean by Indianize genetic makeup is that these uh, newer varieties that were coming from the 1980s onwards were largely crosses of Indian and Indian varieties or Indian and Indian hybrids, not any more crosses of Indian and of foreign plant. They were largely crosses of Indian and Indian plants. And that was, uh, so newer traits from Indian last land race materials uh, was being incorporated into uh, plants and uh, crops. And an excellent example here would be uh, the more recent variety uh, of Pusa Basmati 1121, which was notified in 2003. And here you will see on the left side, the lineage of PB1121, uh, uh, where you will see from 1966 onwards, here is, you will see uh, Taichung Native 1 coming at the top, and it was part of the parentage story here, and right up to uh, Pusa Basmati, which was uh, inaugurated or notified in 2003, you will see a series of uh, uh, crosses across Indian land races uh, was a very important feature of this time. So uh, basically, this is essentially an Indian variety now, not anymore uh, a hybrid of Indian and a foreign germplasm. Uh, this is also uh, an advance in multiple other ways. Pusa Basmati 1121 uh, has much higher yields compared to its counterparts, which were developed a decade or two decades prior to it. And it also has lower duration now from about 160 days compared to many other varieties. Uh, Pusa Basmati uh, is only about 135 to 140 days of duration. And that's something, uh, uh, that's another uh, hugely advantageous feature of uh, this particular variety. And then from 1980s onwards, you see uh, science also moving into newly emerging territories. For example, biotechnology, the uh, intergovernmental International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology is established in 1988. Biotechnology board is established prior to that itself. And then also research spreads to new crops, particularly pulses and oil seeds. And you will see here, the number of crop varieties released by the Central Seed Committee uh, from the early 70s to the mid 1980s or the late 1980s, what you will see as remarkable is, of course, you will see uh, the, uh, the uh, number of varieties in major grains uh, growing, but growing gradually, slowly, etc. But the real change basically happens in pulses and oil seeds. You can see here in pulses and here in oil seeds, you will see <coughs> that new, uh, more and more numbers of crop varieties uh, are now released by the Central Seed Committee. And they did play a role in the way production uh, was performing itself uh, during this period and after. Uh, and, and so basically I was, uh, was pointing to this uh, table to argue uh, that uh, research was now moving into uh, new crops, particularly pulses and oil seeds. And what was happening here? In oil seeds, we had this very important technology mission on oil seeds in 1986, which was a real breakthrough moment uh, for a crop outside the rice wheat complex. Oil seeds 
had a real weakness at that point of time because most of its farmers were small and marginal, which meant that the big push by the elite farmers of Punjab, Haryana, etc., which rice and wheat received in the 1960s, was not available as a luxury for oil seeds. 85% of oil seeds were grown in rain-fed areas with poor soil. It was susceptible to pests and diseases. And also, it was not seen as a technologically viable option compared to uh, uh, rice and wheat, which were the two, uh, as they called it, uh, superior cereals at that point of time. So a lot of effort was made to focus on this technology mission on oil seeds, and particularly in crop improvement. So how can you yield, uh, increase the yield potential of oil seeds by 20 to 50%? How can you reduce the crop duration of oil seeds by 5 to 25 days? How can you breed uh, uh, traits of uh, resistance to diseases and pests into it? How can you increase oil content by about 6 to 25 percent? How can you exploit tissue culture techniques in coconut, oil palm, etc.? And how can you provide new uh, nuclear and breeder seeds for large scale multiplication? All these were part of the efforts made under the technology mission on oil seeds. And uh, we basically were focusing on groundnut, rapeseed and mustard, soybean, sunflower, and safflower at that point of time. And here is basically what you see in terms of the trends in the yield of oil seeds. Between uh, uh, this, this is the period that uh, I want to bring to your attention. The uh, early 80s period, when you saw a remarkable jump in the productivity of oil seeds in India from about 240, uh, uh, 240 uh, kilograms per hectare to about 327 kilograms per hectare, which after that you will see in a rather unfortunate turn of events, literally plateaued, literally stagnated. And you actually today are at an E level, actually lower than your E levels recorded for 1993 in oil seeds. So here you have a success story, which was more like a blip, but then stagnating uh, for the remaining part uh, uh, after uh, 1993. And this also shows up in production. This is in million tons. You will see this particular phase of growth very sharply. And if the trends had continued at that same level, you would be somewhere here. But all these uh, dots that you see uh, data points that you see after about 2000 are actually below the trend line, consistently below the trend line. So this crisis of oil seed production happened after showing huge promise in the 1980s. Why was it? The reasons were clear. You had actually, uh, uh, India actually in 1991 was producing 98% of its edible oil requirements. That was the kind of shift that you saw. Uh, during this period. But once the WTO agreement was signed, oil seeds were included in, under what is called as the open general license. And there was a flood of cheap imports of oil seeds into India, which basically destroyed what you would today call as the Atmanar Bharta of oil seed production. By 1998, about seven years after 91, India was actually importing 30% of its requirements. After 1998, import duties were further reduced and area cultivated under different oil seeds like mustard, etc., fell and imports rose. And today, India is world's largest importer of vegetable oils. And this here is uh, an example of how policy destroyed the promise of science, how neoliberal policy destroyed the promise of science in the uh, field of oil seeds is something that becomes clear here. The case of pulses, here again, you had clear constraints. Again, people considered it inferior to rice and wheat, also because there was no assured MSP or procurement for pulses. There was also poor scope for development and adoption of high yielding varieties because uh, pulses are more self-pollinating rather than cross-pollinating. So there's little scope for heterosis breeding to take place. You wanted short duration seeds of about uh, 60 to 70 days in chickpea or 120 days in PGNP or 60 to 65 days in green gram, which was not available. And because they were, these were uh, cultivated in rain-fed regions, 
you actually needed what are also called as climate smart uh, seeds. And only about 15% of the area cultivated with pulses are irrigated. And the number is actually 46% for food grains as a whole. So your very poor levels of abiotic stress tolerance, particularly to drought and heat. You also have heavy infestation of weeds in pulses, as well as blue bull and pot borers. Right? And these are, uh, apart from root rot, uh, wilt, etc., in chickpea and so on, these are indicators of poor biotic stress tolerance. And in addition to all these, you also have post-harvest losses during, uh, during uh, storage, where due to excessive moisture and attack by different pests like pulse beetle, there's an enormous crop loss. And to top it all, pulses, uh, in pulses, seed replacement rates are very low, just about 2 to 7%. This is where you wanted the availability of high yielding cultivars uh, adapted to multiple environments and conditions. Uh, you wanted to improve technologies of crop production. You wanted to enhance protein content. And a lot of activities uh, uh, were initiated during the 1990s and after in terms of how uh, the research on pulse development was, uh, was uh, transformed and how new seed varieties were developed at that point of time. So you had a large collaborative research uh, in pulses beginning uh, in the 90s onwards, ICAR, the Indian Institute of Pulses Research, uh, and a network of partners, including ICRISAT, played a very important role here in developing short duration varieties of chickpea, pigeon pea, et cetera. Uh, ICARDA was actually instrumental in working on lentil, uh, grass pea, et cetera. The World Vegetable Center uh, worked on moong bean and urad bean, and all these, uh, were developed into new cultivars. And public policy over the years also played a very important role through different kinds of interventions uh, via the plans of the each uh, period at that point of time, beginning from the fourth five-year plan. So ultimately, your pulses were actually slowly catching up in terms of research uh, uh, through the 90s and 2000s. And here you will see the trends in the productivity of pulses in India. These are in kilograms per hectare. And this is the period that uh, I, I shall bring to your attention. Between roughly 2004-05 to about 2019-20, where productivity, which was stagnant till that point of time, uh, began to increase rapidly from about 543 kilograms per hectare to about 823 kilograms per hectare by 2019-20. This was very important a period. This also will show up as increased production. All this uh, phase of about 11 million tons uh, in about 2004-05, you see it rising to uh, 26 million tons by, by 2021. Last few years, we have seen an extraordinary rise in the production of uh, pulses. Uh, so pulses is certainly uh, a new success story in agricultural research and, and uh, the diffusion of technology for sure. Now this, so basically what I was doing at till this point of time was to focus on crop specific examples. I have about 10 minutes more. And in this period, uh, I will uh, look at a certain sets of related literatures uh, uh, in agricultural research. Uh, now the first is related to a lot of literature and writing exists uh, with respect to uh, total factor productivity and rates of return to public agricultural investment and so on. Uh, you see there's a proliferation of papers uh, which will actually focus on calculating PFP uh, in agricultural research and so on. I'm, so I'm, I belong to a set of economists who are hardly uh, convinced by the robustness of this estimate called total factor productivity. I'm not going into the details of it, but basically uh, uh, a one sector production function uh, 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 is assumed here. And uh, you assume full employment and perfect competition. You assume constant returns to scale and diminishing returns to factors. And also, you look at partial equilibrium as a good substitute for general equilibrium. As a result, what you get is actually after all the input induced and input impu imputed effects on production are taken care of, are controlled for, the rest that you get in terms of the coefficient, in terms of the residual, is what is called as uh, belonging to technical change. But in fact, this is not technical change because it is actually the remainder of everything else that you did not consider, including the assumptions, the errors and assumptions, uh, errors in assumptions that you have made in your production function and estimation process. So, so uh, uh, 
this the two very fine papers that i've provided as references below which will provide you detailed critiques of tfp and their uselessness or meaninglessness in uh, this kind of research so i'm not getting into it in greater detail now uh, but there is another set of literature which is very very important because they link public agricultural investment and rural poverty uh, Schengen Fan, Peter Hazel, and Sukhdev Thorat and others have done an enormous amount of work where they actually show that government spending on productivity enhancing investments have actually contributed not just to agricultural productivity, but also to the reduction of rural poverty. And that's something that is very important, a set of work uh, that I want to flag here. I'm not going into that in detail. The readings are there uh, as the footnote. Uh, this brings us to the period of economic liberalization. And I will argue here that there are continuities between the pre-liberalization and post-liberalization periods, but there are also major shifts or changes. The shift uh, uh, from uh, pre-liberalization to post-liberalization is first, in terms of continuity, you see the green revolution seamlessly merging into the gene revolution of the 80s and 90s and later. So, but this is a, I, I call it continuity because there is a long period of uh, work which happens prior to this, beginning from Mendel's work uh, in genetics uh, from 1900 onwards uh, through the double helix model uh, of DNA in 1953, Watson and Crick's, and in 1973 when Cohen and Boyer uh, discovered the recombinant DNA experiments. And when finally the US Supreme Court gave in 1980 patent protection to genetically modified organisms, which the coming of molecular markers which the coming in of the use of recombinant DNA technology to develop genetic, genetically engineered transgenic crops. All these create the so-called gene revolution where there is more precision and predictability far higher compared to the trial and error method that was practiced in primitive agricultural research. And that is something that uh, is a very important uh, continuity yet change uh, in this period. But more important as a matter of change is something else. The discontinuities are very important because here you also see the rise of intellectual property rights in a big way after the WTO agreement was signed. Basically, IPRs are instruments used to enclose knowledge for profit. And that is an undoubted feature of gene revolution that we should not miss sight of. There is no more the free presence of germplasms for open research as they existed during the Green Revolution period. There is a weakening of public agricultural research that happens. This graph basically tells you the share of agricultural investments, public agricultural investments in India as the share of total uh, the GDP from agriculture. Okay, Agricultural investment as a share of GDP from agriculture. You can see from over the last 20 years or so, you are at a rather stagnant level of 0.5% of GDP spent, agricultural GDP spent on agricultural research. You know how much is spent by developed countries? 3%. 3%. You know, you know there is an average for developing countries available, and that actually shows 0.68. India is lower than the average for developing countries in terms of you know, uh, public agricultural investment as a share of. Uh, agricultural GDP. So this stagnancy of expenditure is something, an investment is something that is remarkable uh, during this period. And this is why I call it weakening of public agricultural research, because this is the time when agricultural research in the public domain should have forayed into biotechnology, should have forayed into genetic engineering, and, uh, uh, and, and matched the research by private agricultural research uh, institutions during this time, and large corporations during this time. They've shown that it is possible. And this is also the time where you have concurrently strengthened private research corporations. So ultimately, innovation and diffusion are subordinated not to a social good, but to private profits. And given the nature of flows of uh, capital across countries, global finance as well. And this is where some, something that uh, Dr. Sandeepan Bakshi mentioned in the beginning, I want to flag it again. I'm very happy that he said it in his uh, in his introduction. The distinction between, and that's where we have uh, we uh, 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 those of us who call ourselves belonging to the as belonging to the progressive camp, says may I say, 
should ensure that we make this distinction between technology and who owns the technology. Now, this distinction is not, we should not exaggerate this because this over a period of time, what you see is uh, our differences of, of opinion with the ownership of the technology ends up manifesting itself as an opposition to the technology itself. We oppose the technology because the technology is owned by Monsanto. But how can you socialize that knowledge? How can you capture that knowledge into public domain and make it available under public domain to larger sections of people and farmers? That question remains unexplored because you remain in some kind of dogmatic opposition to the technology just because it belongs to a particular corporation. And this is something that is very important to note at this point of time. Yields have risen. Nevertheless, even though private financial, private agricultural corporations uh, put out the new varieties and hybrids, yields have risen. But it's also true that costs of seeds and other inputs have also risen, leading to profitability risks. And here, I provide you with the productivity uh, estimates uh, for, uh, uh, for cotton. And here, sorry, you will very clearly see that the productivity is a completely different story after BT cotton is introduced into Indian agriculture. Now, you can say that there is some fluctuation here, but that fluctuation is within a much higher mean compared to the mean that existed here. Okay, So the fluctuation should bother us because cultivation is spreading to rain-fed areas where there is less water and hence cultivation is more uh, risky. And as a result, you do see fluctuations in it. But nevertheless, it is a fact that uh, that production productivity has risen. And this is something that is extremely important to note. And this, I shall close with uh, one slide, uh, 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 Professor Swaminathan. Uh, so this era- About five minutes, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So this era of private-led agricultural research that we see is marked by a period where private agricultural research is seen as a substitute for public agricultural research. But that's not how globally it has been seen in every successful case. Private research across the world covers only a small subset of the needs of the poor, small and marginal farmers. Technologies developed by the private sector have been mainly suited to capital intensive forms of commercial agriculture with high value added aspects of the farm. There's a very interesting paper by Parde and Bentima, which is below there, which is uh, useful reading in this context. Private sector research focuses mainly on development of herbicides, insecticides, and technologies related to food storage, transport, and processing technologies. And in India too, private sector agricultural research is confined to just a few crops, not all crops. Maize, sunflower, cotton, pearl millet, oil seeds, sorghum. Why? Because that's where the possibility of hybrids as opposed to varieties lie. And that's where, as a result, profits lie as opposed to open research by public research agencies. Now, this is very striking when you look at the case of seeds in India. You know, all these, we have, we have had a long history of the National Seeds Corporation, Seeds Act of 66, State Farms Corporation, State Seed Corporations, etc. But from the 90s onwards, when we entered the era of neoliberalism, what we have seen is a, a trend of encouraging private sector seed production as well. So National Seed pro Project of uh, the, the, the third phase of it, began, which began in 1987, became an instrument to encourage private sector seed production and research after 91. In the new industrial policy of 1986, these seed and biotechnology firms were reclassified as core industries. So entry of large foreign firms became easier. And with the new seed policy of 88, there were more incentives and exemptions provided for private players in the seed industry. Foreign equity in a seed company was earlier limited to 40%, but after 91, 100% foreign equity was allowed in the seed industry. Seed imports were freely allowed for research purposes under OGL. And finally, the introduction of intellectual property rights in plant breeding also became a reality in India. So all these meant that the seed sector in India is completely looking different today as opposed to 30 years back. Today, as a result, private sector seed companies produce low volume, high value seeds. Basically, they focus on hybrids in oil seeds, maize, cotton, vegetable crops, etc. And the public sector produces high volume, low value seeds. So there is a clear division of labor 
that has emerged between public sector and private sector. All the profit-centered areas are captured by the private sector. Public sector has withdrawn from them, and public sector is into low low value seats primarily. And so, of the total seats sold in India, that's the latest data available. About 59% is actually sold by the private sector today. And the share of private sector in the total quantity of seats sold is, is different in 42% in paddy and 53% in wheat. But that's because more of more there is more public sector varietal presence there. But in other crops where there is private sector hybrid presence, you will see that it's up to 95%. So the share of private sector in those seats is 95%. In cotton, it's close to 100% actually. So uh, this is something that is uh, a remarkable uh, feature uh, of the shift of public to private uh, in uh, the seed research that you will see. So I will uh, slowly uh, close my lecture here. I had a few more slides, but I'll, I'm going to uh, skip them. Maybe we can take some of them during uh, the discussion. I did want to consider some of the aspects of uh, criticisms that have arisen as in the form of debates uh, in uh, uh, with respect to the green revolution technologies and so on. Uh, but the point I, want, I would like to make here is that the expansion of science and technology in Indian, Indian, Indian agriculture was a remarkable phase, a remarkable phase where you saw not just the country achieving uh, food self-sufficiency, it moved from being uh, dependent on PL480 food aid from the Western world a ship to mouth existence, so to say, to a situation of food self-sufficiency or in other words, political sovereignty itself by the early 1990s. That was a remarkable feature of Green Revolution and the expansion of science and technology in the public domain in Indian agriculture. This led to increase in productivity, increase in incomes, increase in nutrition, though this leaves a lot to be desired. We know because distribution is a complete mess in India, which has been further exacerbated by the exclusionary neoliberal policies when we move from universal uh, systems of public distribution to targeted systems. So distribution is a very different story, but in terms of production, it is clearly a success and we need to move into more crops. We have moved into pulses, oil seeds, et cetera, but we need to, we need to move into new crops as well. Uh, there's uh, some, Kumar, th yes, I, a lot of interesting questions. So perhaps closing sentence. I'm closing. Yeah. So, so this is something that is remarkable in terms of the contribution of science and technology to Indian agriculture, as well as Indian economy itself, because a lot of uh, uh, conceptual textbooks will tell you that industrial development itself is largely dependent on how fast agriculture grows. So that's a different story, of course. I'm not getting into that. But very clearly, the contributions are immense, commendable. And the only matter of worry in this new context is uh, the move from uh, the shift of emphasis from public agricultural research to private corporate agricultural research. That's where a political movement has to continue in a different way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be looking forward to taking questions from you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ram Kumar, for... Uh taking us through a century or, or more than a, you started in the 18, uh, late uh, 19th century, more than a century of uh, change in agriculture. And uh, I could not see the footnotes. So I'm not sure if all the other participants saw the footnotes. So I will request uh, uh, the FAS to share those footnotes with the uh, participants, because I think uh, there's a lot of material that we need to read and uh, mull over. Uh, there are a lot of questions already, and I will turn to them, but uh, I will put one which, I mean, any of you can answer these at your, uh, in your own order, is really, you know, playing the devil's advocate that, yes, um, not just green revolution, but the gene revolution, uh, all these, um, there have been adverse uh, negative effects, particularly in the context of the environmental issues, and, you know, how do we do, deal with that, you know? Do we go back to traditional technologies? There's a very big move uh, globally uh, for you know, going back to an, uh, traditional technologies where possible. So I'd really like you to address that at some stage. But let me add a few of the questions. 
And I think one very important question which has come is on distribution, but not, uh, you know, not from the point of view of consumers, but Amit Kumar Sharma asks, how will you solve the problem of disparity between caste and class uh, that have actually been created by this new technological developments? Uh, there's a, there was a question on the role of productivity in your graph uh, of rice production, but I think you answered it's not area, but productivity that was uh, mainly the, played the role there. Uh, there are a couple of questions which are very interesting from Dharmaraj Narendranath on you know, what are the new areas of challenges? He says that should the science and technology now focus on protein, nutrition, reducing the carbon footprint, in, uh, in uh, achieving higher productivity rather than on you know, high production alone. Uh, and so this whole, what is the role of science in climate change, you know, in dealing with uh, mitigation of uh, impact of climate change on agriculture? Uh, so maybe you could take these two questions uh, on class, cast and class and climate change or new, new areas, and then we can go on to the others. Uh, please unmute. Yeah. So, Madhra, thank you for those questions. And in fact, the they precisely deal with the slides I could not use uh, because of lack of time. So, I'm going to allow me to share two or three slides where I will quickly try to answer uh, these points. Uh, the first point is with respect to inequalities on, and different uh, distributional issues uh, that uh, were raised. You know, it was something that was discussed a lot during the 1960s and 1970s, if you look at the literature. Uh, basically, uh, there's a very beautiful uh, review paper by Professor J. Mohan Rao uh, in a book edited by Terence Pies in the 90s, which deals with this issue in great detail. But the point here is that uh, uh, India moved into green revolution without implementing land reform. The, the diffusion of technology uh, that was attempted in India though was successful in many ways, was not successful in many other ways, A, in, in, in achieving its full potential and ensuring distributional, uh, uh, distributional certain amount of distributional uh, uh, justice uh, because land remained unequally distributed in the country. And that is something that has class implications as well as caste implications. Dalits and Adivasis were largely devoid of uh, secure ownership rights to land. So this relationship between organization of production, property rights, and technology diffusion is something that is discussed a lot in the literature. Uh, Professor K. N. Raj uh, in 1969 compared India, Taiwan, and Mexico and said, if you do not have institutional reforms, and then if you put in technology, the transformation of traditional agriculture, it's an indicator, indicator to what Theodore Schulz would say, uh, it's a re response to Theodore Schulz, transformation of traditional agriculture would get reduced to just a promotion of dualism. And, and Raj has been proven completely right in many ways. Uh, if you look at the uh, numbers after uh, 1970 and how India's structural transformation has proceeded. Sukhma Chakravarti also wrote a lot on it. The diffusion of agricultural innovations cannot be effective if the system of property rights inhibits risk-taking or channelization of scarce resources. And Prabhat Patnaik, uh, writing about the complete absence of land reforms, uh, spoke about the unevenness of green revolution across regions, across crops, and across classes. And we could add across castes as well. So this is something that is uh, out there in the literature. Uh, excellent writings are there in the 1960s and 70s, which are worth reading. That's what I would say about the distribution question. Let me come now to the question of environmental implications and so on. One of the big uh, uh, arguments against uh, the Green Revolution technologies is one, that they create an increased dependence on external inputs. That's something. Rakumar, sorry, can I just interrupt because we have a couple of uh, questions on the green revolution in terms also of leading to monocropping, focus on rice and wheat, uh, changing the consumption pattern. So can I take all that and can, can you mention all that yes. and then I can take them uh, all together? Yeah, th that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So this set of questions on uh, a green revolution um, and uh, then there's another set of questions, partly which you have answered, but on small and marginal farmers 
and why in states like Uttar Pradesh, we don't have, you know, the why the diffusion of science and technology is low, that's related to your inequality question. Uh, yeah, so there are lots of questions. So if you can take these up and then we'll go on. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so let me go back to that slide. Uh, so one important criticism is the whole question of external dependence on uh, increased dependence on external inputs, chemical inputs, so to say. Now, uh, the question here is, can you run a modern agriculture with zero dependence on external inputs or not? That's obviously not possible. So very clearly, it is a question that is dependent on a lot of other factors. For example, to the extent to which farmers can afford inputs alongside at rice and meals. That means there is, it is not a problem if there is increased dependence on external inputs, if they are provided at a cheap cost subsidized by the state. It's, it's, it's as good as zero dependence on external inputs economic, in, an, in, a, in an economic sense. So that's, uh, the, 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 it is dependent on that. So it's dependent on public policy there. It is also something that is dependent on uh, whether the government as a policy is ready to subsidize the inputs or not. In the last 25 years or so, you see increased hesitancy on the part of the government to increase subsidies on inputs. So dependency on external inputs would become too expensive for the farmer as a burden. The also, it also depends on the extent to which the public sector participates in the production of inputs. Are you going to leave all the production of inputs to uh, large multinational uh, or national companies, or would you want to balance them with substantial presence of public sector as well, for instance, in fertilizer production? That is a third question. The fourth question thus is also dependent on uh, what is the appropriate framework of research and policy that you have in the country, in the economy, which will uh, intermediate between the farmer on the one hand and the external input on the other. If there is a democratic intervention by the government, it is quite possible that this dependence is actually uh, negated effectively uh, uh, through different policy instruments. Uh, now, there is another point here. Can the question of external inputs be delinked from the real nutrient needs of soil? Indian soil is notoriously absent. Half of Indian soils are notoriously weak in nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, and multiple micronutrients like boron, molybdenum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, can you simply ignore this? Can, for example, what uh, in a recent uh, uh, so-called uh, fake innovation, you have what is called as the zero-budget natural farming, where it is argued that uh, application of uh, uh, cow urine and cow dung can actually take care of the nutrient requirements of plants. It has become uh, a favorite uh, uh, propaganda story for uh, the right-wing Hindu nationalists because this also uh, escalates the cow into a national treasure of some kind. So, but the funny thing here is they provide what is called as Jivamrit. And here you basically have the application of 10 kilograms of cow dung and 10 liters of cow urine per acre in a month. And this means for a five month season for a crop, given the nitrogen content in these two materials, you only get about 750 grams of nitrogen per acre per season. The question is, is this sufficient or not? Any scientist worth his or her value will tell you that it is a complete bogus technology, but we have it adopted as part of public policy, right? So in I'm yeah. going to come in. Can you stop your screen sharing, please? <coughs> See, can we stop the screen sharing? So, I mean, there are a lot of questions. I think this yeah. is, sorry to interrupt, but <laughs> there are some questions on hunger and so on, which sure. we are not really going to deal with today. But there's a question, very interesting question from Siddharth Baidya. Why is Monsanto such a dominant agency while an agency like ICR is not? <coughs> I think you you talked about this, but if you could give the crux of you know what what is it that has uh, led to a situation like that today? Well, science policy in Indian agriculture during the neoliberal period has been focused on ensuring that private profits of big corporations like Monsanto are preserved. Let me take the example of this GM technology which has come. Let's take BT cotton. Here you had Monsanto coming in with its. Uh, uh, cry AC1, 2 genes and so on with new varieties of BT cotton, with new hybrids of BT cotton, may I say, while 
public sector was focusing on varieties of BT cotton. Central Institute of Cotton Research in Nagpur developed what is called as the Bikaneri Nirma BT cotton, which is actually an open pollinated variety compared to Monsanto's uh, hybrid, which meant that the farmers could actually save seeds and sow as well. But this was not a pathway uh, acceptable to the profit interests of Monsanto. They advocated for a complete halt to that research program in the Nagpur center, and they were able to kill the research program on public sector BT cotton varieties in order to ensure that Monsanto's private sector BT hybrid captured 95% of the Indian market. This was the complete opposite of what happened in China. In China, it's the opposite. 95% of the cotton in China is actually cultivated with public sector BT cotton variety. Right? In other words, they are available at a cheap price. They are available uh, for farmer to save and sow again with while maintaining the genetic characteristics and traits. And this is something that Chinese government did, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences did, uh, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences did, and it basically drove Monsanto out of China by pricing it out of the seed market, right? And that here you can see two public policies, one in China where public agricultural research drove private corporates out of the Chinese market, and Indian science policy where a red carpet is provided for private corporate research in agriculture, where uh, the, the, the BT cotton as an area of research is sort of reserved for private corporate profits. This political economy of neoliberal period is extremely important to be highlighted. I think that that was, uh, I'm going to, uh, I just, I think we have time for two questions. So uh, one, I'm combining questions from different people. One important set of questions which has come, and I think it links to what I raised, is as Dr. Venugopal says, uh, Professor Ratanlal reminds us that we sail towards seed instead of soils. And there is another person who asks about you know, salinity and soil health. And I think this organic movement in a way is one of the concerns has been uh, you know, soil, soil health, if you like, rightly or wrongly. So I think if you could address that question, what is the role of science and soil health? And the second set of questions by a couple, Himanshu and others, is about uh, the startup space and how can we have, what should be the policy for agriculture startups, particularly those that can benefit, you know, small and marginal farmers. So these two sets of questions, and then we perhaps have to wind up. Okay, the first, if I heard it correctly, uh, we move to uh, seed and instead of soil. Health. Soil, yes, that's right. That is a very important part of the story because if you look at uh, the other part of the criticism of the Green Revolution, which is then an environmental consequences due to the increased use of chemical inputs on soil health and so on, the larger question here, I think, is the following Can agricultural research over time produce seeds and plant types? that are not dependent on the application of chemicals in the soil. Ultimately, that's where agricultural research as an endeavor should move towards and is certainly moving towards. Can you produce seeds which are not dependent on application of chemicals in the soil? And, and that is where the importance of not just GM seeds. In fact, technology has moved far ahead of GM seeds today towards gene editing and so on, which provide huge possibilities in terms of developing seeds uh, with very specific qualities and traits, which were unthinkable, uh, say, 20 or 30 years back. So we need judicious and scientific use of chemicals, not indiscriminately overuse them. That's a no-brainer in many ways. But that's also a question of how our agricultural extension policy is designed. Are we investing enough in agricultural extension, creating enough awareness among farmers uh, to judiciously use chemicals and inputs? That is yet another question. The final point is agricultural science itself has moved into new arenas where it is actively promoting the use of less chemicals in agriculture. For example, in many places you will see no tillage farming uh, coming up in a big way. But no tillage farming sometimes is not acceptable to proponents of organic farming because it sometimes includes necessarily the use of GM seeds. Right? So that whether that is uh, 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 that is acceptable to them or not remains a question. 
Agricultural scientists have also come up with what is called as GAP, good agricultural practices, safe to eat food, nanotechnology. The, one of the big problems here is uh, you put fertilizers into the soil, but a lot of only a part of it is absorbed by the plant and the rest remains in the soil and it leads to pollution while soil erosion runoff happens, etc. That is taken care of through nanotechnology where the seed comes already with a pre-coating that is a coating of uh, chemicals in it, which is just enough for that seed to germinate and grow. So no chemical application is required for the first 45 days. The, uh, the research from the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University has shown enormous promise in this uh, area. Finally, integrated pest management, where agricultural, it is agricultural scientists who promoted IPM. They said that you, you use less pesticides and you give more importance to uh, the natural uh, 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 natural species in the uh, ecosystem, which are actually, uh, which actually uh, eat up the pests. And uh, you try to think of crops as an ecosystem and uh, you, you, you tweak your varieties, time of harvest, cultivation practice, fertilizer levels, etc. And when none of this work, you apply for pesticides. And, and this idea of integrated pest management is also something that agricultural scientists have put forward in the more recent time. So there's a lot of things uh, that are happening in the sphere of seeds and soil, where the idea is to create seeds, which will not ultimately require uh, chemicals in the first place to be applied. Uh, startup space is the other question which came, and that's a very complex area because startups are largely coming into uh, processing and marketing uh, in agriculture today. That's where uh, a lot of opportunities exist for them, not exactly in terms of agricultural research, because a lot of uh, there are a lot of entry barriers to agricultural research uh, today okay. because of the presence of large private uh, startups are also largely an extension. Uh, he's saying startups are an extension, agricultural extension. Okay. Startups, uh, they're also in agricultural extension. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this is yet another. Uh, uh, feature of uh, startup space, which is important. And, and, and there are a lot of startups coming, but the problem is in areas where they should actually matter. If you're thinking about agricultural research, there are entry barriers created by the presence of already entrenched large players. And that's becoming a problem for startups. Startups are able to come only when there are possibilities of specific technical innovations, which are possible, or digital innovations that are possible, which will help them to transcend a particularly complex or difficult stage in the existing uh, value chain uh, phenomenon. So that is something which is extremely important. Many states have uh, uh, started to create uh, uh, favorable ecosystems for startup development. And uh, uh, while we don't have hugely successful examples to point to, it is certainly a growing space that we need to look out for. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ram Kumar. Uh, Thanks, Yes. Uh, <laughs> Professor Ramachandran, would you like to say something? Would you like to have... No, on startups, I completely agree with Ram Kumar. But uh, that, you know, one thing is it should not merely be a, an activity which fills up the gaps in the, the present national agricultural research systems. Our present weaknesses in extension and uh, extension, research development and extension, on the one hand, you should encourage startups. On the other hand, you know, you can't expect them to fill up the space of the public authority in research development and particularly extension and supply chains. That's a, uh, that's a minor point. Uh, yeah. so I think we, uh, we will send you these questions and, you know, uh, maybe some of the speakers uh, uh, will uh, directly communicate with him and he, I'm sure, will reply. Uh, I want to just end with a suggestion for some of you, which is a very interesting book called uh, Tomorrow's Table uh, by Pamela Ronald and Raul Adamczyk. And the subtitle is Organic Farming, Genetics and the Future of Food. Pamela Robin, Ronald is a geneticist. Her husband is an organic farmer. And the point really is that I think what they make is that these two are not opposites. And in fact, if you, uh, if you take up CRISPR and genetic editing, you can have very well-designed interventions in science and technology that 
uh, reduce the use of chemicals, but as you mentioned, nanotechnology, reduce the use of pesticides and are therefore, or reduce the carbon footprint and are therefore more climate friendly, uh, more friendly in terms of organic material, can preserve soil health. And I think that uh, this is very important that this debate on uh, alternatives and organic agriculture is a scientific debate. And I think that's, uh, that's something that you brought out and also ensure that the public sector, the public science takes the lead. I think that's a very important uh, uh, point that has emerged uh, when you looked at the phases of growth in India by the public sector, if not dominant, at least was playing a very a leading role as it were, you know, the leading sector and the second phase, the post-liberalization when the private sector has placed the, played the uh, leading role. Uh, I will now hand over, uh, okay, yes. Uh, uh, may, I make a, yeah. may I make a small suggestion that you see there are a lot of questions and a lot of uh, entries in the question and answers box and in the chat box. I was wondering if uh, FAS could actually, you know, uh, bring them together, make a comp compendium of the questions and answers, uh, entries and the chat, because every yeah. lecture, and this is going to happen in every lecture in the series. We will not, we, we will not be able to tackle all the questions in, in the single session. Mm -hmm. So yes, perhaps may, may I suggest to yeah we have compiled as we can in, to in Sandeepan the and uh, Sandeepan and Nihira that perhaps you could also think of a, a final session where we have a panel dealing with the some of the issues that have been raised but not fully dealt with during the year. So we could have you know, actually add another to this series where there's a panel responding to some of the issues that we were not able to address in sufficient detail during the sessions. And that's just not an organizational suggestion. Will be a question R as it were. The students will, or the participants can ask the panelists. Questions, not new questions, but questions that were not dealt with. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. So let me hand over now uh, to uh, Nihira. Um, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would like to thank. Uh, the online events team, I would like to provide a small vote of thanks for concluding the event. I would like to thank the online events team, including uh, at the Foundation for Agrarian Studies, including Divya, Vignesh, Tapas, um, for organizing this event and for um, help, helping and ensuring that it runs smoothly. I would like to thank our chair, Professor Madhura Swaminathan, for stepping in at the last minute um, and carrying this uh, session forward. Um, I would like to thank our director, Sandeepan Bakshi, for um, commencing the event and for coordinating it. Um, and I would uh, like to thank Professor Ram Kumar for agreeing to speak uh, and deliver the first lecture of our session on science and technology in agriculture, which we hope um, will enrich people's understanding and analysis of um, uh, this issue. And I would also like to thank all the attendees for taking our time and also for uh, being with us a little bit later than we had uh, said in, in our um, promotions. But uh, thank you for staying with us and thank you for all your questions. As uh, Vikya suggested, we have compiled them all in a document and we will include everyone's uh, questions and comments in that document. So thank you all for attending and thank you for viewers on the live streams for watching us too. Thank Before you. Before we end, thanks Ram Kumar. It's an excellent start to the series. Excellent uh, start. Excellent start to the series. Thank you. Nahira, would we not, not, thank you. I, I, I think it, one second. Nahira, would we not be converting everybody into... Uh, Sandeepan, there's a lot of people. It wouldn't yeah. be possible. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's okay. more than 50 okay. people. So. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, bye. 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 Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, Omeda.